Sani and Dr. Panja are all in the line? Yes. Yep. Okay. Right. Can you okay. hear me all? Right. Yeah. This is Gunjan Shukla. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear. Uh, okay. okay, great. Uh, Jaisbhai, can you go ahead and introduce? Uh, yeah, go ahead. I think, yeah, let's start on time. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so it's 4 o'clock now. Okay. Yeah. Uh, great. Uh, good evening all. And uh, uh, first of all, I want to welcome you for this uh, fifth uh, uh, tele meeting uh, organized by the American Association of uh, Indian Origin. This is the second meeting we are involving the non medical. And uh, you all know we are facing the pandemic of dread virus COVID 19. And uh, we have some experts today to uh, share their uh, uh, experience, particularly these, these doctors are working in New York, New Jersey area. They did take care of this patient by themselves. So, first of all, I'd like to introduce um, the moderators, Dr. Jayesha. Dr. Jayesha is from San Antonio. He's a board certified internist and uh, he's uh, specialized in wound care, particularly in hyperbaric uh, oxygen. And uh, he is uh, past president of uh, American Association of Indian Origin and also current board of trustee of uh, Texas Medical Association. And uh, Dr. Lokesh Hidra is a board certified allergy immunologist, and uh, he the, actually he the person initiated this uh, tele meetings through the AAPI. And I welcome both uh, uh, Dr. Jayesha and Dr. Lokesh Hidra. Dr. Jayesha, please take over. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, is Dr. Reddy is online? Suresh Reddy, by any chance? Th thank you, Dr. John Lagada, uh, and thank you all for joining. Uh, and thank you to Happy Leadership for giving me and Dr. Lokesh Edara opportunity to moderate this session. Uh, we have all got together. Uh, we have all got together uh, today to learn more, learn from everyone's experience, and apply them today in our practices, so we can help our patients right now. And for all non-physicians, I welcome you as well, as you are the backbone. Many of you have come forward to volunteer and help us during this crisis. Pandemic happens once in a century. Last pandemic was about 100 years ago. This is definitely an historic event. And we all are the soldiers trying to help during this crisis. I would like to take a moment to recognize all the healthcare workers. They need our salute as they are like our soldiers who are working 24 by seven. With that moment of applause to all the healthcare workers, I would like to introduce our distinguished panel, and uh, I would like to talk about the today's program. So our order of presentation today, we'll get an overview uh, of the condition and what's going on presently about COVID-19 by Dr. Raj Bayani, who is an ENT physician and present treasurer of AAPI. And then we'll talk about symptoms and signs and mode of transmission by Dr. Siris Patel, and he's the internal medicine physician in Kentucky. And then we will have, uh, we'll talk about cardiac issues, especially with COVID patients, and that we'll, we'll learn from Dr. Gunjan Shukla. He's board certified electrophysiologist and a cardiologist that he's going to talk about that, and he does take care of COVID patients right now. We will have, uh, we'll be talking about triage criteria in office setting, protecting office staff, family, and taking care of nursing home patients uh, by Dr. Himan Patel, who is the internal medicine physician working right in ground zero and is a medical director of multiple nursing homes and urgent care. Uh, then we'll talk about social distancing, quarantine, and lockdown, and Dr. Sumul Pandya, who is in New Jersey, he's a neuro-oncoradiologist, uh, and he will be talking about uh, social distancing. And then last will be infection control, mask, protective gear in hospital settings for healthcare worker, and latest treatment guidelines and any role of profile access. That will be discussed by Dr. Samit Desai, who's an infectious disease specialist, and he's really working very hard in ground zero uh, right now in New Jersey as we speak. So I think we have a very good panel. This uh, people have first-hand experience. They're working right at the ground zero where this is happening, where the real help is needed. So let's hear f from them and uh, let's uh, see what we can do to help uh, all our patients. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Raj Bayani. Uh, thank you, Jayesh Bhai and Dr. Sudhaka Janalagada and Api for giving this opportunity. So for the overview, I would just update very quickly. There are more than 700,000 cases all over the world, out of which 30,000 people have been 
died because of this unfortunate pandemic. 135,000 cases are in USA, out of which, fortunately, I would say the death rate in USA is very low because it's one of the best care which we are all providing to our uh, population and community. Out of which uh, 135,000 cases in USA, 60,000 cases are in New York. And the death rate in, in uh, New York is also very low, is about 965 cases. So and in, in uh, New York City itself, we have about 33,000 cases and out of which 192 cases are fatal. So overall, though the fatal rate is low, but the cases in the US are rising very rapidly. So it is very important that we follow the guidelines of all the experts and, and help the government and the population and the doctors to help the general population. I am myself an ENT surgeon, and just to make you aware, one of the first doctors who got infected in Wuhan was ENT doctors as per the report from Stanford. And so because ENT physicians get exposed to these symptoms of sore throat, cough, runny nose, the patients come to us. I myself, I believe was infected. So I'll just give you my symptoms and how it comes. So initially it started as sore throat for me, then dry cough and stomach upset with mild diarrhea. So one of the most important distinguishing factor is loss of taste and smell. The smell did not go away for me, but the loss of test, especially the loss of salty test is very prominent. That makes you feel that all the food is bland. Uh, as you see, there are a lot of suggestions how to treat once you have it. And one of the recommendation is taking hydroxychloroquine, which I had taken and along with the zinc, thiamine, vitamin C and vitamin D, and also Zithromax. The There is some anecdotal evidence uh, that it helps, and there are uh, Grutel et al. The paper from France suggested it decreases the viral load if you take it. And also, when I was researching myself, I saw the hydroxy, uh, the chlorhexid in gargles is effective on coronavirus. I used myself for my sore throat, and actually, it did help significantly to clear the sore throat. So, at the same time, being the uh, one of the President of RP Queens Long Island chapter where the burnt of disease is very high. We are very active helping our members of RP and RP QLI. So we are distributing the personal protective equipments. We distributed 4,000 face masks in New York area, about 1,000 hydroxychloroquine uh, doses and hand sanitizers, as well as the, uh, what we call as the Lysol sprays. So we are working very hard. We need everybody's help. With that, I would just say the prevention is the key. And for prevention, as recommended, please stay home and please protect yourself and protect others around you. And with that, I'll conclude my session. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you, Raj. And uh, Dr. Siris Patel. Hello. Thank you, Jayesh. And thank you, Api. And thank you, all participants. Uh, I'll be talking, uh, the most common question everybody has is, how does person-to-person -person transmission occur? Now, it's being a new disease, there are a lot of theories, but the most common understanding of the transmission is a droplet transmission. What it means for the normal or general population is that virus is released into the secretions when an infected person coughs, sneezes, or talks. And particularly when touching the infected surface and then after followed by touching your eyes, nose, or mouth, person gets infected. The droplets typically do not travel more than six feet and do not linger in the air. So for general population, it's not an airborne disease, but particularly for the healthcare worker, it could be transmitted by air, particularly when you have a prolonged context or exposure for 20 to 30 minutes, like staying in a patient's room or involving high risk procedure, like uh, 
intubation or suctioning of respiratory airways also patients are thought to be most contagious when they are symptomatic but also they could be contagious one to two days before their infection also the infectivity period is probably like 10 days from the starting of the symptoms in milder cases but it could be as long as 20 days in people with uh, severe infection after starting first symptoms the incubation period means like from the first exposure to the time it required to develop the infection is generally thought to be between 2 to 14 days but most of the people does develop symptoms within 4 to 5 days of uh, exposure now most of the people develop very mild disease in almost 80% of the people very 15 to 20% people develop moderate to severe disease and require hospitalization and seeking medical care the most common symptoms are starting with sore throat and coughing in almost 80% of the people followed by fever and most of the people they just don't feel good feel fatigue and tired few of the people does develop headache and dizziness as well as loss of sense of smell as raj described earlier and very few people develop gi symptoms which include intense nausea with abdominal cramping now as i described most of the people symptoms are mild and subsides but few people start developing shortness of breath 4 uh, to 5 days after developing symptoms and that is the time is to seek the medical attention otherwise most of the people can do self isolation and quarantine and they can stay home uh the clinical uh, signs are most of the people as i described uh, who develop shortness of breath they need to go to the hospital and seek medical attention and the most common findings early findings are people who develop hypoxia or lack of oxygen and also developing pneumonia which could be starting uh, in one lobe of and then spread to both lobes of lungs and then a uh, patient can develop into multi system organ failure the other common marker is elevated c reactive protein but the other labs are very non specific also the question is that how long virus survives on different surfaces now this as discussed earlier it does not stay in the air for a longer period of time but on a surface is like plastic and steel it can survive up to 3 days on the clothes and cardboard or porous surfaces it could last up to 24 hours on the copper surfaces surprisingly it lasts only for 4 hours and i think uh, that's where i would conclude my session thank you okay thank you i, I just want to uh, the happy leadership uh, just send me a reminder that i need to say a disclaimer so i'll just read out the disclaimer quickly for everyone just to bear with me this is dr shah i'm just reading the disclaimer that this happy teleconference does not really uh, provide medical you know provide medical advice but if you have any symptoms because there are many non physicians here you need to go to your physician okay the information that we give uh, at this time is based on the current knowledge so a lot of times the not uh, this 
the, this is an ever moving target and whatever we know today it changes in an hour or two hour or in six hours so just keep updated make sure you get a medical advice with a physician uh, whom, whom you have relationship so whatever we discuss here is just for uh, information and knowledge and uh, I just want to make sure that we have that uh, disclaimer before we move forward the second thing I need to do housekeeping right now that uh, make sure that you are able to write down three numbers and uh, write down your questions and text uh, your questions to these three numbers one is Dr. Jayesh Shah it's 210-289-5500 I repeat, 210-289-5946. The another uh, number uh, you want to write it down is Dr. Lokesh Idara. Dr. Lokesh Idara's uh, text, uh, the cell number you can text is 1269-209-7233. And the Dr. Sudhakar Janlagada cell number is one nine one two three oh nine zero three four zero. So please send your questions, uh, text them, and once the panel finishes the discussion, we will entertain your uh, questions uh, in the in the time that whoever comes first, it will be first come first basis. Okay. So with that, we'll have Dr. Sukla talk about the cardiac issues that he's seeing in the patients with COVID-19. Thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. I, first of all, um, I'd like to thank everybody, uh, uh, RP President uh, Suresh Reddy, uh, Janal, Dr. Janal Gadda, Dr. Shah, and Dr. Dara for inviting me uh, to give this um, uh, and share idea about the cardiology perspective. Uh, as we have heard uh, a lot about the COVID-19 respiratory illness, uh, but we have been discovering slowly that there are actually a lot of cardiac involvement happens with this disease. Uh, so I'm going to go uh, through a little bit of overview of the cardiology uh, perspective, little symptoms, and uh, how to tackle uh, the disease. Um, although I would not cover most of the therapy, which will be covered by infectious disease doctor. So uh, just to give you an overview that how the heart get involved in a, a coronavirus. Um, so any virus uh, can involve uh, the uh, any system of the body, and uh, approximately about. 10 to 15 percent of the cases we have seen the cardiac involvement uh, with the coronavirus. Um, a myocardial involvement uh, comes with the different kind of modes. Uh, obviously, virus has to go to the lung and blood and then ultimately involves the heart tissue as an end organ. Um, it seems that it enters into the, into the myocardial cell by uh, a specific receptor called angiotensin receptor 2, uh, that, and that's how it gets uh, endocytosis and enters into the heart cell. Uh, it can also have a certain effects on the heart tissue. Mainly the mechanism is probably inflammation, uh, which can cause a plaque rupture in the myocardial vessels, can cause an acute MI. Uh, it also can affect the heart with a cytokine storm um, and uh, weaken the heart tissue. That's basically a sepsis kind of mechanism. Uh, and the fourth mode of injury can cause hypoxic uh, heart injury, uh, causes myocardial suppression and acidosis. So these are uh, the pathophysiological involvement of the heart tissue. Um, um, uh, now, what effects uh, it would it would cause? So mainly the people who have a pre-existing heart condition, uh, those people are uh, very vulnerable and they are at increased risk of myocardial involvement. And once the myocardium gets involved with this virus, the death rate goes very high. Uh, so what are those risk factors for the general public? Uh, if you have diabetes, uh, high blood pressure, uh, prior history of coronary disease and stents uh, and heart attacks, if you have a congestive heart failure, if you have a history of smoking, or, or if you have a history of uh, bleeding disorders or coagulopathy, those group of patients are at increased risk of myocardial involvement, involvement and seriousness of the coronavirus diseases. Um, uh, it, can, it can cause a certain patient about patient it causes a fulminant myocarditis. Uh, so that is called an inflammation of the heart tissue. 
uh, which is basically your blood vessels are open, but the heart muscle is very inflamed and causes a lot of uh, enzyme release in the blood. Um, second mode, um, it is called a congestive heart failure, which is basically a suppression of the heart tissue. Um, and and uh, because of that, uh, you have a shortness of breath, pulmonary edema, uh, about 25% of the cases uh, with the cardiac involvement shows uh, congestive heart failure. Uh, the third most common condition uh, which we worry about and I'm specialized in is uh, uh, heart abnormal beats or cardiac arrhythmias. Uh, these cardiac arrhythmias can have a variety of uh, things. A uh, uh, little bit more on the benign side is atrial fibrillation, but uh, we have seen patients with a cardiac arrest, uh, ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation, and uh, I have actually one or two case report of uh, sinus pauses or a complete sinus arrest or AV nodal involvement, which requires pacing therapies. Um, uh, now, sickest of the sickest patient uh, would ultimately go to the, uh, what we call it end stage heart disease or cardiogenic shock. And that may require uh, terminal uh, heart failure um, um, uh, therapies. Uh, there are a few percentage of the patient also gets an acute heart attack. Uh, that is basically the cardiac blood vessel gets blocked and then uh, you have to open the blood vessel by stents or balloon. And a very minor percentage of patient also gets uh, what we call it a, a thrombus disorder. In a, in a medical word, it's called a disseminated intravascular coagulation. Um, so uh, what we are recommending right now uh, for the doctors uh, who are actually at, uh, at, uh, uh, at a front line, what kind of test needs to be done? If patients with the uh, mild symptoms, uh, actually no test is recommended at this time. If patient is in a stage two disease like hypoxia, and if they require an hospital admission, the cardiac troponin uh, measurement is recommended. Um, if cardiac troponin is positive, there are some non-invasive tests that you can quickly rule out the myocardial blockages or blood vessel blockages by CT scan or echocardiography. Um, there is also, uh, if there is a stage three disease or patient is on a ventilator or a, a terminal, uh, then uh, also there are some recommended tests it will be continuous troponin measurement and cardiac DNP measurement, which is a, a marker for congestive heart failure is recommended. Now treatment part, I'm not gonna uh, go into detail with the medical therapies uh, infectious disease wise, but uh, uh, if you have an ST elevation MI or acute heart attack, it may require a clot buster medication, which is called a TPA or tissue plasmin plasminogen activator. Um, if there is a high risk acute MI, then you uh, have to rush to the cath lab to open the blood vessel by stent. Uh, there is a other common question arises uh, or people ask me all the time uh, about AC inhibitor. Uh, many of the patients who have a high blood pressure, they take medicine called AC inhibitor. As I've, I've, I've told you in the first part of pathophysiology that this virus enters via AC, AC inhibitor enzyme or AC2 receptor, uh, these kind of receptors are in abundance in the people who are in AC inhibitor therapy, but currently uh, USA or European guideline does not recommend to stop ACE inhibitor uh, in any patient at this time. Um, other therapies, if it's a terminally ill patient or complete cardiogenic shock patient, uh, ECMO therapy is recommended. Uh, or, uh, some people may require an impella therapy. That's, uh, that's a temporary cardiac pump uh, uh, for the heart to get through uh, to severe condition. Um, at the last but not the least, I'm going to uh, 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 cover a little bit of QT interval prolongation. Right now, the, uh, you have all heard about these uh, drugs, hydroxychloroquine and Zithromax, uh, which is being used uh, for this disease for the French study. Um, however, we don't have any exact or, um, or a clinical trial data so far. This is all for the anecdotal evidence. Uh, but these therapies will be very careful uh, without medical supervision uh, because we have seen that uh, both of these therapy can cause QT prolongation uh, or a, a cardiac interval prolongation that can cause dangerous heart arrhythmias. Um, there have been some reported um, deaths because of that. 
so we have a guideline uh, for the doctors over here that if your QT interval on a baseline EKG, if it is greater than 500 millisecond, if patient is not in a stage two or three disease, do not start hydroxychloroquine because it can cause severe cardiac arrhythmias. Uh, current guideline, accordingly, we are, we are uh, telling our infectious disease doctors uh, that if, you, if your uh, baseline QT interval is uh, 470 millisecond, or if you have a wide QRS and baseline interval is greater than 520 millisecond, start hydroxychloroquine with a very, very cautious use. Um, and if you uh, do an EKG after two hour of administration of HCQ or hydroxychloroquine, if your QT interval does not increase or increase less than 50 millisecond, you can continue uh, cautious use. But if your QT interval increases by 50 millisecond, uh, you have to stop this medicine because arrhythmia risk goes very high. Um, so um, uh, this is about the myocardial overview of the of this disease. Again, I'll be around here for if you have any any have a, a follow up questions or guidelines. I'll be happy to uh, answer those questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Gunjan. Uh, we'll ask Dr. Himansu Pandya. He has uh, he's working at Ground Zero and he's internal medicine physician. So I think uh, we wanted him to focus on how to triage uh, these patients in the office, how to protect your office staff, and he goes to nursing home, which is uh, uh, you know very important to look at. So, Dr. Pandya. Yes. Uh, thank you, Jairus Bhai, Sudhakar, and the entire AP. Uh, for giving me the opportunity. It's since uh, COVID-19, uh, it's a very difficult to manage even outside in the community. And a lot of people are having anxiety what to do. As an outpatient setting, we get on an average 35 to 40 calls a day that patients are complaining of some weakness, cough, fever, shortness of breath, so the first thing uh, I want to clear that every fever and cough is not the COVID positive. What uh, we recommend that uh, if you have a cold, cough, and fever, the first you isolate yourself before uh, you do anything. There are two alternatives you have. First, you call the primary care office. The reason that if you have a symptoms of a respiratory tract infection, primary care's office needs to be ready when you go there and they want to make sure they can protect you because uh, sometimes even if you, you have symptoms, it might not be the COVID positive and you can get exposed to other patients, they might have the COVID uh, infection. So number one thing, call your physician's office that I'm having these symptoms A, B, C and I would like to come and see the doctor. Once you speak to the doctor's office, you schedule the appointment. When you come, uh, you need to make sure that you go to the uh, secretary directly and they will guide you probably to sit in the, the room or they, you will get the mask if you don't have it and you, will, you are going to sit in the uh, room. Physician will come and see you. Number two, as a physician, what I need to do. So first, we need to prepare this, our staff because uh, staff is also very anxious about uh, what's going on right now. So we provide them enough information to how to use the PPE. It's uh, mainly gowns, uh, face shield, or the big goggles. Third thing, that uh, mask that uh, includes the regular mask. And if we are seeing the patient mainly suspicious for COVID, we use the N95 mask. And the last thing we have, uh, gloves. So secretaries and our staff members has to be ready with proper personal protective equip equipment because we do not know sometimes patients are coming with the lower back pain and they have symptoms of a respiratory tract infection. Also, the staff needs to be aware if patient walks into the clinic, how they can triage them quickly and they can separate those patients from the other patients. And uh, that's a very important thing. So we recommend that every clinic should have, if they have a 
enough rooms, at least one or two rooms for something called, there are two categories. It's uh, PUI, something called person under investigation for the COVID. And other categories are PUM, person under monitoring. Mainly the hospitals are using this category, but we actually consider anybody comes to the office with symptoms, it's a PUI, person under investigation. Once they come, we keep them in the separate room. A physician gets uh, as much as history, uh, and then the a patient needs any further assessment or the test, we we usually do it in the office, but if, if we follow just the CDC guidelines, they have certain guidelines to get it in the office. If mild symptoms, 85% we cover at home, and uh, we do not do the test. But uh, there are people who have comorbidities, we try to get the test done, and usually we get the result in 48 hours. Also, we tell the staff, if you are sick, you are not feeling good, please stay at home. Also, we give the instruction to the staff, if you call us that you are not feeling good, there will be no punishment, that they should not be having any fear, because most of the time the staff is thinking that if I call them sick, that uh, something might affect. And uh, we all know that our staff members are always working with us, so we give them the immunity about that part. Let's say if they are having symptoms, they should stay at home and uh, nothing to worry about then. Sometimes they develop symptoms while at work, we send them home. We tell them to rest at home. You don't have to go for the test, isolate yourself. In three days of no fever or no symptoms, they can come back to work wearing the mask. And that's exactly the guidelines from the Department of Health. Uh, also, when patients are coming, sometimes uh, we want to make sure they have enough mask when patients are sick and also they should have a hand sanitizer. We try to minimize those patients' visit as much as possible, but uh, still we don't have control over that. Uh, the second, uh, uh, second thing I have is for the nursing home. And the reason I want to take a little more time for nursing home, because I have treated more than 70 patients in the hospital for COVID positive and I'm checking almost 22 as outpatient positive and more than 50 are quarantined without any test, considering just the symptoms. And one thing I realized, very strong factor, nursing home patients have a highest mortality. So we, we are counting right now the oral mortality. So young generation are not actually getting these uh, uh, numbers, but the mostly I have seen because I was talking to a few of my nephrologists who are going to dialysis and they told me most of the dialysis patients have actually had a very high mortality. So nursing home patient, what actually we need to implement that as a nursing home, I'm a medical director of 400 bed nursing home. So we spoke to Department of Health, CDC, and we had long discussion about uh, what to do. So any, any staff member come to the nursing home uh, we always tell them that if they are not feeling good, they should not come to the nursing home. But every single person, including myself, when I go to the nursing home, they check my temperature. If the temperature is 99.5 or 6, we tell them to go back home. Or we tell them to wait here, we'll check it again, but we would not allow anybody to go inside if temperature is high. The second thing is that uh, we have to protect the residents also. So anytime any residents getting problem with the upper respiratory tract infection, we immediately isolate them. If there are two, uh, mostly nursing homes carry, uh, in one room they keep two patients. We try to isolate the first patient. We were having so much difficulty about uh, moving the residents because uh, when they are in the nursing home, it's like for them is to changing their house. It, that, that's how important it is for their room. But uh, we were able to explain to the family, and this is good for the uh, resident itself, they are all understood. So first thing, we isolate them. Second thing is that because of the mortality, uh, we strictly do the swap for corona, just want to make sure. Second thing is that we stop the visitors as per the New York State uh, mandated that. Also, we told the consultants, if it's urgent, then they should come, otherwise not. 
any suppliers or any resources are coming to the nursing home, we have a policy to keep those things separate for at least 48 hours before we use that or before we open that one. We made a sick leave policies and other occupational health consideration that no punishment if somebody calls in sick, but we tell them that not to come if they are not feeling good. We also provided the education and training to all of our staff regarding how to use the PPE. Luckily, um, we have enough PPE in the nursing home, and that's the reason that the staff wants to come, because when they know the staff has the biggest fear, if you do not have any per, um, personal protective equipment in the facilities, they really do not want to come that. Also, we looked at that uh, any alternative for the uh, staffing supply. Uh, if the staff members cannot come, what will be the alternative? So we are working with the alternatives also. We looked at that instead of their eight hours of the shift, we can do 12 hours, and that way they can get even a little extra. Uh, something uh, is beneficial to them and beneficial to us. And uh, this is what we are doing in the nursing home. But uh, one thing I would tell you, out of my this experience, maximum mortality is nursing home patients. So we just need to be very careful. And thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. All right. Uh, thank you, Himansu. That was a lot of good information. I'm sure you will have the most questions. Uh, the next one uh, is Dr. Sumul Rawal. He's going to talk about social distancing and quarantine and lockdown. Uh, please, Dr. Rawal. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sudhakar, John Agal, Lada, Dr. Jay Shah, and entire RP for organizing this webinar. This is very informative and useful for everybody. We talked about signs and symptoms. We talked about mode of transmission. We talked about cardiac issues, triage, and diagnosis. I'm going to talk about very important factors in this medical global medical disaster. We all heard about social distancing, quarantine, lockdown, all different levels, including locally, statewide, and nationwide. I'm going to try to tell you a few um, scientific um, information about social distancing, lockdown, quarantine. Um, we talked about social distancing of six feet uh, with each other. Why do we do six feet and not five feet or six feet, or I mean five feet or some other distances? So when we sneeze or cough, it create about one millimeter droplet. Most of the time it can spread up to six feet and then drop on a floor. Nowadays we're learning so much since this is new information that not only sneeze, coughing or sneezing create the droplets, but just speaking normally can create micro droplets, which can be 0 0.1 micrometer and can stay in, in, a, in air and atmosphere for even a lot longer. So it is extremely critically important that we have social distancing to create this to some extent, a bay. Now, talk about the quarantine. What is quarantine? Either it is self-quarantine at home, maybe best with your family, or forced quarantine, either at institutions or places or separately isolation in different uh, locations. Now, what we're telling right now, since I'm in New Jersey, in, in probably we have more than 13,386 patients in, in, in a small state of New Jersey. We're considering everybody is infected unless proven otherwise. So we're telling people to have just a self, self of safe hygiene techniques with frequent hand washings personal hygiene, and social distancing. So I want to tell you what lessons we learned and what lessons we did not learn from other countries. So flattening the curve is the most important in this current situation. Now, I can't talk about everything in so much detail, but I'm going to tell you to understand a few things very briefly. So to better understand how countries are handling this outbreak, it helps to break it down into the two phases. The first 100 cases of patients is considered phase one, and every other case after the 100 is phase two. So the reason is for this. This breakdown gives a clear idea of which countries are successfully flattening 
therefore, or reducing the number of new daily cases. For example, Japan. For for Japan, so 13% of daily increase in a case before it reached to first 100 cases, and then it went down to 8.1% daily increases in cases from 100 cases to its worst or latest. So decrease in an average daily increases in a is indicative of flattening the curve. And several countries like South Korea, Singapore are say on the same path. So what did you learn from China? Flattening the outbreak, flattening the curve, flattening the outbreak curve is critical for the disease management. In addition to what government is doing, our personal action might be the most important issue, self-isolation, seeking medical advice remotely unless symptoms are severe and social distancing are the key. Now, we talk about lockdown. We're talking about lockdown at local city level or state level or even country level. All levels, <clears throat> personal, home, city, state, or nation are required to control and flatten this curve as it is most important next step. It remains, it may require many sacrifices both at the personal and national level, but this will prevent healthcare system and healthcare workers in a front line to get overwhelmed and get infected. So bottom line is that we rapidly control the disease by achieving radical quarantine. Radical quarantine, I repeat this twice, radical quarantine is the most important thing, tracking and isolation and extreme social distancing. And with that, I'll stop here. Thank you, Dr. Rahul. Thank you for uh, talking about social distancing, one of the most important thing that has been found to decrease uh, community transmission. Uh, the next one is our infectious disease specialist from New Jersey area, Dr. Samit Desai. Uh, can you please uh, start? Sure. <clears throat> Thank you for this opportunity. Um, so let me go through a few different things, uh, quickly go back to the infection control um, stuff that was mentioned earlier. From an infection control standpoint, the, there's at least uh, three different levels of infection control that are recommended from the CDC. One is the administrative control, which was mentioned, I think, earlier, but things like limiting visitors to the hospital, having um, temperature checks on uh, certain units and certain um, employees. Um, having uh, available um, in the lobby Purell uh, dispensers, having glass barriers when you're triaging the patients, having um, uh, a separate area to screen and triage the patients on the outside of the hospital, and then using face masks um, on the patients also when they're being triaged. Um, and then a second level of engineering controls, which, as you know, like physical barriers, having isolation rooms, separate rooms for patients, and um, cohorting patients if they're both confirmed positive COVID, but not cohorting if they're for investigation. Having um, uh, dedicated medical supplies, um, having specific environmental cleaning policies and disinfection policies, um, including, including for the medical equipment. Um, and then obviously the third level is the personal protective equipment, which was mentioned. There are four, four types of personal protective equipment that are recommended, the gowns, the gloves, the eye protection, and then the face mask. And with all of these different uh, types of controls and, and barriers, everything unfortunately changes day to day, as was mentioned earlier. This is like rapidly evolving. And so even the CDC, even though sometimes you wonder if it's a hospital policy or if it's coming from CDC, the CDC does have uh, three different levels of uh, preparedness that they that they refer to. One is conventional capacity, which is your usual when everything is available, when you're not over overflowed, overflowing with patients. Second is a contingency plan that happens um, as the case rate increases, and you have to kind of day to day make changes and um, open dedicated COVID units and um, decide on which resources, which. Uh, um, protective personal equipment can be reused, such as goggles and face shields. And then getting to a, a even higher level, which is the crisis capacity. And this um, is kind of where some of the hospitals are in this New York, New Jersey area. And in this case, uh, they've gone on to uh, certain things that are not usually considered a great idea, but are being instituted, such as um, allowing 
people to bring homemade uh, face masks, um, having reuse of personal protective equipment. Um, and what's being studied in um, Nebraska is also a uh, UV decontamination of an N95 mask um, as, a, as part of a protocol study that they're doing. Um, so these are the things that we're doing, you know, from an infection control uh, perspective. Um, the other thing I think he wanted me to focus on was to just quickly touch on the guidelines for treatment. Um, and, you know, this, as, you, as everybody call probably is aware or maybe not aware there is actually no proven treatment despite all the case reports and different studies coming out of China and um, uh, different people's experience there is not a standard treatment that's acceptable so what is recommended is ideally to have your patients enrolled in clinical trials so that we can learn which of these drugs will actually have efficacy um, I've looked at the guidelines from at least five different institutions including you including uh, Mass General University of Michigan um, as well as some of the hospitals in the New York, New Jersey area. And there is not a standard protocol for like what to do with the patient and when, when to use which drug. The drugs that were mentioned are the ones that are being trialed, including the hydroxychloroquine, uh, which has some in vitro uh, inhibition um, um, of, of the virus and also has some um, inhibition of the ACE2 receptors where the virus attacks. Uh, the use of Zithromax, which was based on that one small study, um, from France, um, and then uh, different medicines such as remdesivir, which is an antiviral agent that had activity you know, um, in the original SARS and MERS viruses and is being studied for the SARS-CoV-2. Um, and then for more seriously ill patients, uh, medications such as tocilizumab, which is an IL-6 inhibitor, um, and other drugs that were studied but are not proven to be beneficial so far have been drugs such as Kaletra, which is an uh, HIV medication, and then ribavirin, which is used for other types of um, viral infections such as RSV. Um, and then the one last thing he, I, I'm going to just touch on was this um, thought about uh, using hydroxychloroquine for pre-exposure prophylaxis. Right now, there is not a uh, recommendation for that and there's not a proven benefit to that. There is a ongoing study out of University of Minnesota um, where, they're, where they're studying this. And I was also forwarded another study that's going on in India um, that is also looking into this as a possible way to protect healthcare workers. Thank you, Samit. That's awesome. I think uh, we have heard from all the panel members. That's very good. Uh, there's a lot of good information here. I have got hundreds, hundreds of questions uh, already texted to me, and I'm sure Dr. Lokes has uh, questions and Dr. Sudhakar. So what we'll do is we're going to kind of start uh, questions. Some of them will group together. So most likely we will be able to answer your questions, but it will be not exactly in your words. So uh, I just want to make sure some of the questions will be similar, so I'm going to group together uh, so that the, we can answer majority of the questions. Uh, are we ready for the Q&A uh, and we can move forward? So the first question is, uh, and that I will ask Dr. Pandya, are the recovered patients still carriers and can potentially infect others. Dr. Pandya. Yeah. So that that is a still we we have a very limited information available for recovered patient. Uh, certain uh, hospitals in the USA they are looking at this one whether they are developing antibodies or not. We do not have enough information at this time to answer this question, but uh, the studies are going on whether they are developing immunity and they cannot get the infection second time or not. But it's too early to answer this question. Okay, I think second question is also for you. Uh, the second question is, my, many of my patients have come positive for COVID-19. Uh, the family members are asking, uh, any advice on how to keep other family members in the house safe, especially elderly? Chances of reinfecting once recovered. How long after symptoms resolve should you remain in isolation? Do we need to be retested? Should we keep our mask in isolation room the whole time? 
Thus, 14-day isolation period start when the test result comes out or from the day we got tested. All right, there are a lot of questions. I think it answers many, many of the questions are similar. So I think if you go one by one, uh, that would be good. Uh, let's give an advice on the family members on a COVID positive patient. Sure. So I would uh, tell you that uh, we are treating so many patients at home. And this is very common for everybody to know that. Our recommendation, if they have any, any family members who are age of 60 or above, we give them strict guidance that keep them on the isolation separate. Even if, uh, for example, son is getting exposure whose age is 45 and the parents are living with the son, we tell them that to make sure the parents also stays on the isolation. The reason behind that age of 60 and above carries actually higher mortality. Sometimes it can go up to more than 8%. So we try to isolate them first. The second thing is that now uh, 14 days of quarantine period is compulsory. We tell the patient to wear the mask, uh, even if he is in the room, because this is the airborne. Sometimes the rooms are not equipped the airborne even can come when the doors are not properly closed or doors are not like uh, sealed uh, properly the way they do the construction. So we tell them that to wear the mask continuously. The third thing is that all the family members, I just had one uh, patient who is a physician, his wife is also a physician, and the husband is positive, wife is negative, and they were talking about the kids. So we uh, as per all the CDC guidelines, we tell them that tell your kids if they are asymptomatic, if they are doing good, we do not need to test them also. So if one person is positive in the house, we recommend everybody to stay in the isolation because you might be exposed to this person. No need to do the test. We follow through the symptoms. And what are the symptoms? Either cough, shortness of breath, cold. Even if they get it, 85% are recovering at home. Uh, and we do not advise them to go out. Uh, and if they are even in the house, we tell them to use the mask because it's compulsory, it's a must, it's an aerosol, and some, sometimes the virus can stay on the surface for a long time. So even if a person is going to one place and somebody goes to that same room after even six hours, they can still uh, get the infection. So this is very important. Now, one more thing I will tell you, what we do for the patient, if somebody is positive, how we are managing at home, we give them instruction to have a thermometer, pulse ox at home. I have not seen anybody getting sick till day seven or day eight. The critical time for this corona, after looking at more than 100 examples, they get sick after, after day number seven or eight. The breathing issue starts between day 8 to 13. We start telling them to use a pranayam, deep breathing exercise, uh, incentive spirometer to make sure your lungs are fully expanded because most of the patient, I send them to the hospital with same issue that they could not take the deep breath. And that was the number one reason uh, their pulse ox was dropping. Okay. So I right. thank you. thank you, Dr. Pandya. Uh, the question next question is for Dr. Desai. Uh, if the symptoms are there, what medication do you suggest to reduce the risk during the initial stage? Yeah, so we do feel that the virus, as was just mentioned, goes through two different phases. So an initial uh, viral phase where it's viral replication causing the symptoms, causing the um, cough and fever and um, symptoms similar to other viral infections. And then the secondary phase that um, was just mentioned after day seven or eight, where it's more of a uh, inflammatory response for the body. And that's what leads to more of the hypoxia and the worsening respiratory status and ARDS. So in the initial period when it's more um, of a viral uh, replication process, that's when these treatments, the hydroxychloroquine and the Zithromax, um, seem to have more benefit. Um, at our institution, we have actually not been recommending the Zithromax because we did not feel that that um, French study was um, very strong evidence uh, based on the very small number, only six patients, and um, 
the uh, control group was was um, had eliminated certain patients that we thought were important to uh, determine the outcome. But the hydroxychloroquine is what we're using in those early periods. Uh, we're doing a five-day uh, course of hydroxychloroquine, 400 twice a day for day one, and then um, 200 twice a day for uh, another four days. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, the question for Dr. Ravel, how are things manifesting differently, if any, among Indians due to social and physiological habits of Indians? Is the disease more common in Indians, and what should we focus on due to these differences? So is there any anything you see that it's more common in Indian because of their habits or something have you seen that is asking you question? Well, this is a very interesting question because um, I had seen the states which has the highest um, patient so far has the most highest Asian population. And I am not sure whether there is any trend to the medical fact to this or these are the states that has highest amount of Asian population as there are more people as in descent there. So I'm not sure that the disease is any separate. So to talk about a little bit about uh, population in India versus population here, I mean, as we know, there's so deeply congested people, population in India. So isolation and quarantine are the two key thing, is, as I mentioned earlier, for, for people in India to be extra, extra, extra pay attention to than, than any other part of the world. Okay, the next question is again for Dr. Samit Desai. For those of us who are bedside staff in the hospital, administ administration is telling us to wear regular mask, all sift. Is this some sufficient to limit healthcare worker exposure? Yeah, so like I was saying, the CDC does recommend that the N95 is only um, absolutely needed in the setting of aerosolized procedures, such as intubation, um, high flow oxygen, um, bronchoscopies, those, those kinds of procedures. The rest of the patients can be um, seen in the setting of a um, surgical mask. Hello, I think we lost him. Uh... Uh, okay, we will move on, and when Dr. Desai comes in, we'll ask him the question again. I think we lost him. So, okay, uh, I am COVID positive patient. Dr. Pandya, this is for you. What medicine can I take? This was already answered, and we also answered the question how to keep their parents isolated. So, I'm going to move forward. If, okay, this is again question for Dr. Bayani. What is the incidence of COVID-19 infection in people of Indian origin in U.S.? This includes physicians and non-physicians. Uh, I don't think we have some data indicating that based on ethnicity or race. So as I mentioned, but in general, the Indians are supposed to be considered to be more immune as per the immunological perspective because we have been exposed to anecdotally malaria during our childhood and people who have been exposed to malaria and who had BCG vaccine, they are more immune. So it's more likely that in Indians, the disease will be less severe as well as less affected. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, there's a question for Dr. Gunjan Sukla. Uh, does the ACE inhibitor, this is a medication they use for high blood pressure and sometimes in a diabetic patient with kidney disease, and also apply to ARBs like Losartan. So does the ACE inhibitor susceptibility also apply to ARBs like Losartan? That's a question for Dr. Sukla. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so um, uh, uh, I understand the confusion about AC inhibitor because this virus enters into the cell by ACE receptors. 
and ACE inhibitor basically uh, blocks this receptor. So what happens when people are chronically on a therapy of ACE inhibitor or ARBs, uh, they have a upregulation of ACE receptor. That means that they have more receptors available. And, and the question uh, arose that uh, whether, because they have a more ACE receptors, whether virus can uh, access those receptors and enter into cell more easily in the respiratory mucosa and also in the heart or kidney. Um, uh, there, there, there is no conclusive evidence so far. Currently, American Society of Cardiology and uh, European Society does not recommend to stop ACE inhibitor or ARB therapies. Um, uh, so uh, ARB and ACE inhibitor, I would put them in the same basket, but, uh, but currently uh, if somebody is on, is on the treatment, uh, they should continue their treatment. That's the current uh, recommendations. Okay, thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Vijaya. Can you uh, uh, can you open, uh, uh, Prasad Garimela pulmonologist checked in, please? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Uh, 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 right. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, can ahead, you can, you want to take a little break? And I'll ask some questions. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Sir, uh, go ahead. Yeah, this question goes to probably Raul, Sunil, Dr. Raul. Uh, how long a COVID-19 stay on surface and uh, grocery items? So, depending on the material of the surface, there's a difference in um, information. I mean, I don't know, anybody knows 100%. Right, but there is up to 48 to 72 hours could be on a cardboard and on plastic surface, it lasts even longer. So nobody knows precise time, but this is what basic understanding that on, on cardboards, it lasts stays longer, I mean, uh, shorter than on a plastic surfaces. Um, Dr. Idara, okay, uh, go ahead. Uh, Prasad Garmil, are you in? Yes, sir. Can okay, okay. If any pulmonary questions, it will go to them. Okay, I'll ask him. So for, for now, uh, there's a follow-up question for Dr. Desai. The best way to disinfect the surface, best agent to kill the virus, and for how long? Uh, uh, is it hydrogen peroxide, chlorine, chlorine, any of those things has any role? Or what will you recommend to disinfect the surface? Um, I mean, to be honest, I don't know the answer to that question. What we use is like the um, standard hospital um, sani wipes that they that they um, use, which um, I guess is like a bleach-based product. Um, but I'm not sure if other products may have equal efficacy. Dr. Jayesh, oh. can I answer that question from CDC? This yes, is Raj Thank yes. you. So the Clorox and Lysol are very effective as per CDC. The common hand sanitizer, Purell, is actually as not effective because minimum concentration of alcohol has to be 70% to, to make it virucidal. So if the alcohol content of the hand sanitizer is less than 70%, it will not be as effective. In that situation, just frequent hand washing with soap and water at least for 20 seconds is recommended. While otherwise, to clean the surfaces, the Clorox or your house bleach and the Lysol and the side eggs are very effective. Thank you. All right. This is a question for Dr. Prasad, uh, who is a pulmonary and critical care specialist. The question for you is, uh, what is the exact criteria for intubation and ventilation? I understand the BiPAP and CPAP may suffice for respiratory problems with COVID patient, but as uh, uh, providers, uh, of COVID patients, uh, we forced to jump to intubation. Step simple, because the virus aerosolizes with the other oxygenation method. Once intubated, isn't the prognosis poor? But how can that be if they were to ordinarily be able to do fine with CPAP or BiPAP? I think this is a very uh, question uh, a lot of our specialists do ask. So pulmonary critical care uh, specialist, it will be very helpful for him to answer that. Dr. Prasad. Yeah, sorry, I'm driving. So, but um, the data is not completely out yet. 
can we intubate the patient uh, if there is a rapidity in the decline of PF ratio or PO2 by FIO2 ratio or the SATs or by increasing the, in spite of increasing the oxygen requirement. Um, so that we, you can, if you don't have any problem with the ventilators or you are not coming close to the surge capacity, I think it is a reasonable choice. But high flow oxygen is proven to be better than the CPAP slash BiPAP. So all these three non-ventilator modalities increase the risk of aerosolization. If you have a negative pressure room, then you could do this with CPAP, BiPAP, and high flow oxygen. Today I listened to the New England Journal of Medicine uh, podcast. In that they were saying high flow has better is better than the CPAP BiPAP. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Prasad. Uh, there is a question. I think there is a lot of questions about uh, how to bring the grocery in the house. If you are getting uh, like a take-home food from the restaurant, how do we make sure that that is not infected with COVID-19 and what precautions should we take? I think this question will be more appropriate uh, based on the presentations that were done. Dr. Rawal, I think you should uh, take on this question unless you want Dr. Desai to answer that. Well, I can say yeah. two things. I want to add one more doctor. Another question. The similar question I'm asking, you know, how about if you go to grocery about the clothes, shoes, and the eyeglasses? Yeah. So, yeah, if you can combine all those in your answers, yeah. please. I think, yeah, I think this is kind of extremely difficult question because we, nobody has answered to this. No way for us to know whether who is, that's what I said earlier in my talk, that we consider everybody positive unless until proved otherwise. We have no way to know where this grocery is coming, who is touching, how it's being handled. So it is no way to predict um, what should we do with this kind of thing, especially the food that we're getting it or, or delivered to our home for the immediate eating. So I think it is, it is kind of difficult situation. Nobody can answer precisely to this. Um, but as I said, to keep it outside, what we do routinely is to keep all the meals outside for 48 hours, isolate, spray with Lysol-based product, and then open it after 48 hours. And similarly with the groceries, we just keep it outside and, and don't use it for 48 hours and then try to use it. So that's kind of basic thing that we're doing other than any scientific information. Okay, uh, Jayesh, I have a question that came from the prophylaxis that are helpful for especially healthcare workers. Sure. Uh, and this yeah. one other doctor, yeah, unmuted, Dr. Jim Thompson, uh, uh, interventional radiologist, flight surgeon. Uh, Dr. Thomas, can you um, uh, talk uh, briefly about this uh, topic you're talking about, uh, India, your experience, prophylactic, because they're very helpful for all the physicians of the front line. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is Jim Thomas. I want to thank Dr. Bindu Kansupada for getting this information to the uh, Hill Indian Health Minister. Um, and implementing, we won't call it prophylaxis, we'll call it early treatment. The reason we call it early treatment is because we assume, just like the last uh, uh, speaker said, we assume everybody is positive in the United States. A little bit of history about this. The first patient, the first physician who, uh, who saw the patient in China was a guy named Li Wenlang. Uh, he saw the first patient in December 2019, and he had six negative tests prior to testing positive on January 30th. What that means is that this virus is a stealth virus. It grows very slowly in the body, and you don't test positive until one week before you crash. That means he died seven days later on the, uh, in, on, in February. That, uh, and so we want to consider, you, you are all very educated and you need to consider that this might be a very, very stealthy, slow growing virus and everybody already has it. Um, with this understanding, we may need to consider this, uh, this hydroxychloroquine as a early parachute, something that you can deploy very early where the hydroxychloroquine we understand keeps the, keeps the virus from going into the cell. 
So if you give it early, there is a theory that it decreases the viral replication rate uh, immensely. Early, sometimes it decreases it by log 10. Uh, we, want to, we want to think about this like opening a parachute early. You have six weeks to open the parachute. If you open it at this, at this sixth week before you hit the ground, the viral load inside you is very heavy, but you don't know it because the PCR tests are very inaccurate. The CDC had the first two reagents they put out were faulty, so everybody was testing negative, but that was faulty reagents. Now, the PCR tests are getting a little bit better, but they are still only testing you positive when the viral load inside the body is extremely high. What we need to do is change the paradigm or consider it. You are all physicians and you must make your own decisions. We, uh, the physicians who have uh, developed this alternative paradigm of a, of a stealth virus uh, want you to consider possibly a low-dose treatment protocol early for you and your families and the, and the high-risk workers. This, this has been developed, as a, and we can share what they're doing in India now, um, which is roughly what we've translated it into is 200 milligrams of hydroxychloroquine, and this is our paradigms, one today, one tomorrow, and once a week until the pandemic is over. That's a very low dose. I hope the cardiologists would think about that and agree that that would not cause any prolonged QT intervals. And at that low dose, even the elderly, maybe even just one a week, forget about the loading dose, will help because the, the half-life of hydroxychloroquine is 22 days. So it gradually is building up. Now, this virus is not only a stealth virus, but we have some words that it can mutate. This, the uniqueness of this hydroxychloroquine is, even if it mutates, it doesn't attack the little, or the little sites that it mutates to. It attacks the general idea of the, of the uh, virus that it can't go into the cells. I don't want to speak too much. I want to... Uh, yeah, thank you, Dr. Thomas. Really appreciate that comment and uh, really good. The next question is for Dr. Desai. Uh, is there a way uh, or is there a proper way of disinfecting your face mask? So, yeah, I mean, the most recent recommendation is basically, um, well, so I guess you, it depends on what kind of face mask you're talking about. But if you have... A, so they want to make sure when they remove the face mask, is there a way properly done? Uh, and how should they store that face mask if they are using the same one for the whole day? Uh, if they have, you know, so I think those kind of things they're asking. So definitely you want to use the back of the face, the, where the strings are and not touch the front of the face mask um, because that's where the expected high um, contamination surface is. In terms of if you're reusing it, then you we are recommending that you put it in like a brown paper bag um, with your name on it, and then that can be you know a place where it's stored and and kept separate and and reused. Um, what we are trying to do is keeping the N95s as reusable, but uh, over the N95 we are still wearing a second surgical mask that is a disposable mask, and then the same thing with that you use the strings and you essentially don't touch the front of the mask and try to try to drop the mask directly into the um, uh, garbage. Um, um, but it's, it's uh, an evolving, evolving thing based on, you know, the capacity of the hospital and the um, uh, availability of supplies. So I don't know that there's a uh, right way to do things for every hospital, um, but that's, what, that's what's recommended. So. Well, right now there's a follow-up question for you, Dr. Desai. Is there a role for a cloth mask? And there are a lot of volunteers in Indian community who are willing to make face mask and distribute to the healthcare worker as a service. Is, is will that help uh, uh, and how can they help us? They want to help us and they want to know how can they make this happen? I mean, as or far as... Useful, is it useful or it's not? If uh, Because they are just volunteers, they want to help. Right. As far as I know, it is not a um, standard recommendation and it is not something that can be safely recommended as a, as a 
first line option if it became again like a, a third line thing where it's like a crisis mode and you have no other option then yes you can use um, homemade um, cloth like bandanas and then wash those bandanas um, but the, the problem with the standard mask is that they have this three ply um, 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 construction which has a high which has been proven to um, have a higher level of barrier protection against the uh, aerosolized particles. Okay. I think uh, I try, a, I yes, go ahead. Yes, Sudhakar, go ahead. Okay. Uh, this is a question which I think anybody in the panel can answer. This is Sudhakar again. What are the different tests available currently and what are the false positive and negative rates? Can anybody can answer the question? Um, I can try. Well, um, Dr. Yeah. Desai, yeah. Go ahead. Try. So currently, the the standard test is a um, you know the nasal swabs that we're using. Those are PCR based testing. Um, the the original test that came out between the um, federal government and the um, individually developed test do have um, a slower turnaround time, uh, something like 48 hours um, on average, as far as I'm aware. There are some new tests. One is by Cefiad which I think has been um, set to have a 45 minute turnaround time. And then yet another one that's supposed to have like a 15 minute turnaround time. The, the testing is the same. I mean, they're all um, uh, swab based testing, um, but I guess, I don't know what the exact difference is as to why the turnaround time has improved, whether it's um, um, picking up a different um, part, of, part of the virus that they're able to amplify more or whatever the reason is. So, in this location, one more thing they added here is for the uh, physicians when they use the clean face mask and heated with ultraviolet light can kill the virus. And also goggles, goggles and double gloves are uh, also very important. Go ahead, next one. Okay. Uh, one more question to Dr. Desai. You know, the chemo prophylaxis recommended for the healthcare workers and also the household contacts who are infected with COVID, you know. That's just answered. Yeah, yeah, is, uh, yeah, yeah. We, 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 uh, uh, there is a one more question for pulmonary and critical care person. If Dr. Prasad is here, uh, any uh, role of Actemra? Actem, I haven't heard of this drug. A, a C T E M R A. Initiate Actemra uh, for patient who are caregivers who have been exposed to ARDS or pneumonia cases. Uh, I have not heard of that drug, so I'm not so, going to answer, so, unless someone has any information on that. So, Actemra, uh, yeah. Yes. Can I, yeah. Yes. Actemra is, is the same as uh, um, the drug that I mentioned earlier, Pocilusum. and it's So, it's an IL-6 inhibitor. Um, oh, okay. It's used for the later phase of the patient are actually like a storm. Which is which is like after, you know when they're getting um, debated, a, uh, developing ARDS, but then also developing uh, different types of um, elevation of their inflammatory markers, their ferritins, their C-reactive proteins, and you and sometimes hypotension. So it's that cytokine storm where it's shown to be possibly effective um, because they studied originally in uh, a different population cancer. Uh, CAR T treatment, and, they, and that's when they used it originally, and so they thought it would have efficacy in this. And we have used it on um, at least like three or four patients that I'm aware of, and it has shown dramatic benefit um, with their fever and their hypotension, um, not as much of an initial benefit in their um, hypoxia. Wonderful. Dr. Uh, I think this can go to Dr. Bhayani or Dr. Pandya. Uh, what are the role of home remedies like ginger? lemon water, turmeric and honey, tulsi, anything uh, like this, uh, does it have a role? Yes, I believe uh, all these are immuno enhancers or immuno modulators. And yes, as Ayurveda says, it does increase our resistance to these common elements where there is no allopathic treatment and there is no harm. So long as we are using these medic, uh, these these ingredients in moderation and use it right way. The turmeric, ginger, ashwagandha, jest mud, 
all these things can help to increase the boost immunity and it has been known it has no harm so people should use it wonderful uh, one more question healthcare workers now are taking they are changing the and, and for all the people who are on the audience they are asking that when they come back from the office or from the hospital uh, they are taking the shower and they are putting their clothes in the laundry but should they put a separate laundry or can it be mixed with others is uh, samit or uh, emanshu i think one of them can answer i think the the main idea is if we think that it still lives on the surface of the clothes not to um have a situation where the clothes are again handled uh, by somebody with their with their hands and potentially contracting the virus so washing it in the same machine with the with other clothes shouldn't be the issue the issue is where you're uh, storing it in the interim if you put it directly into the washer i don't think that would be that much of an issue um because then it's washed uh with the hot water but um if you are transferring it from a laundry basket back you know with your hands and um th and then you're risking um, exposure so okay uh there's a question for Dr Pandya i think uh, in your triage will you use telehealth first before taking getting those patients in the exam room or getting do you use telehealth as a to prevent uh, your employees and your patients from getting exposure as a screening tool or doing the visit i think he... dr pandya dr pandya that's for you is he unmuted otherwise we can ask doc any one of you can answer that dr desai i think uh, we're getting or dr bayani if anybody yes. wants to take that actually i do use telemedicine uh, definitely in our practice and uh, we use uh, the platform called doxy me and the medicare actually has approved the billing the the payment may be a little bit less but you can use the same codes as you generally for your new patient or follow up visits and make a place of service 02 and use a modifier 95 for commercial use and gt for medicare medicaid it is a, it is a very effective tool and what we do is we do have our same as a triage but it's all online with video conference do we document very clearly the amount of time spent on the patient and uh, we also actually have the patient do ent examination which whatever is possible by opening the mouth and for flashing the uh, torch in their mouth and looking at it with the video and the same way uh, just asking the same questions and then treating them accordingly so we are using it definitely as uh, in fact that's the only way we are seeing patients now dr desai there is a question for you uh, is anterior nasal swab enough or we should we do nasopharyngeal or oropharyngeal swab right so the recommendation is for nasopharyngeal swab um, if you if you choose to do both to try to improve the yield then you can do both nasopharyngeal and oropharyngeal but if you had to just pick one the nasopharyngeal is the, not the anterior okay, okay. if if someone uh, got uh, uh, covid-19 positive on march 15 and they got uh, uh, will worse and now they are getting better does that mean now they will be okay uh march 15 so it's around 13 days so dr pandya if you want to answer that question I think Dr. Pandya is muted. Vijay, can you check? No, 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 sure, sure. No, no, I'm here. You're there? Okay. Uh huh. Yeah. Yes. If you can go with that question one more time. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I was uh, COVID positive on March 15th, and uh -huh. uh, my symptoms got a little bit worse uh, last week. But now I'm feeling a lot better. Does that mean I'm getting better? Yes. So. most of the patients we have seen if you are actually positive on march 15 and today is 29 so you are a day 15 today 
So most of the symptoms I have seen, more than 95%, that usually it gets worse from day number eight or nine to day 13. So I would say in your case, I would not worry about anything because if you cross day 15, you are actually better off. I have not seen anybody who came to the hospital that had a symptoms after 15 or 16 days, not a single patient. Okay. No, next uh, question. Jesh, yeah, uh, question. Jesh, Dr. Uh, Idara. Dr. Idara has a question. Uh, uh, one uh, second. Um, Medicine uh, is a great tool for triaging. We need volunteer physician to take call. Raj Yasha, MD, MBA. And also, let me add another on telemedicine question is, uh, um, uh, Medi Medicare, uh, I'm doing this FaceTime and WhatsApp. They allowed until this cri COVID crisis is done. So to add to the um, uh, Raj uh, question, telemedicine, we am using FaceTime, WhatsApp, new patients, regular course with the modifier. So I just want to add that. Uh, go ahead, um, Sadaka, next one. Okay, thank you. The uh, question is, uh, uh, I think either Himanshu or Dr. Desai, any value of mask for general population without COVID-19 positive or disease when they go to the grocery store? You mean the face mask? I think Dr. Yes. Lokesh can answer that better. Lokesh, you've been sending those studies, so you, maybe you want to answer that. What we learned is, um, I mean, um, the droplet, uh, one of the country called Czechoslovakia made mandate on March 18th. So we'll be knowing in two weeks what is the result. Their numbers are what will happen next few days. Uh, historically, Japan, we still, I'm looking at the Japan numbers, they're about 1,200 and very, very low. Uh, whenever there is a flu season comes, they announce in the newspaper, I um, mean, uh, on the video, wear the mask in the January. That is their culture. So um, downside is it even if it is a it is a decoration, but when we talk, the water droplets will definitely stop. Maybe partial help, maybe ten percent help, maybe we don't. But I I personally will writing letters to mandate it for at least next two three weeks because uh, isolation, all those things in this country is not like a China or uh, India to do the mandatory raising. And also I heard today New Jersey, all the Indian stores closed. I think more contamination there are touching each uh, vegetables, veg all the things, and the probably employees got infected on the way everybody talking. Um, in front of it, three feet, it's the, the talking, the droplets falling on the face of the employee or vice versa. So I'm, uh, we're in favor of it, even if we don't lose anything. They all can be, I have the video there, which is there. We're going to send out the letter from RP requesting that. I'll stop there. Okay. Uh, yes, one more question. Okay. Uh, 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 are they repeating the test after 14 days of quarantine for positive patients to know virus is present or not? If you're, you're talking about patients who are known to be yes, yes, yes. Uh, after quarantine, they are repeating the test again to make sure the infection is gone or not. Uh, I mean, so they have because of the issues, they're not recommend, they're not uh, requiring testing as part of the way to clear quarantine. They're recommending they're saying you can be taken off quarantine if you're at least seven days beyond the start of your symptoms and at least three days beyond any ongoing symptoms or fevers. Um, Another question I can add is, in the village of Vivo, Italy, they, they tested 3,300 people and uh, they quarantined all of them and there is 3% uh, of the population pa positive. Even after 14 days, there are six more patients still be positive. So that's why I think Modiji did three weeks um, because of that, um, uh, three weeks quarantine. And um, I think they do shed the virus through the fecal material a little longer, we still don't know. Uh, that's one question. The other um, answer. I have another question for coming. One more question. We are hearing deaths of some younger patients also with no pre-existing condition. Thoughts on that? I think a lot of physicians are up uh, in New York seeing this. Uh, can Anyone can answer. So, so the question is, the younger patients are getting COVID-19. What, what is anybody seeing that trend? <laughs> Yeah, we're, we're yes, definitely... I can answer that one. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So, my patient population mostly between 40 to 60 years. Uh, most of the patients, uh, what we have a three stages of uh, oxygenation. One, we try up to 
when uh, nasal cannula up to 5 liter 6 liter we go there if person is still having hypoxia we go to 100% non rebreather directly if 100% non rebreather is not working or patient in respiratory distress we go for ventilation ventilator uh normally right now i have seven patients are on ventilator we try to activate two patients on day one on day five and another one on day eight we had to reintubate both of them all i have seen once they are going on the ventilator minimum is 11 days we could not do any changes so the problem with the covid crisis of the ventilator is minimum actually their period is like 11 days 11 to 12 days uh mostly younger patient no comorbidities and the one thing that i noticed for all three patients uh we had to intubate that on thursday that they deteriorate within 2 hours because i made a, my round at around 9 to 10 o'clock in the morning by 2 o'clock i got the message the two were two were on the ventilator they deteriorated so fast when i saw that actually at that time i made a decision that i would able to send this patient home next day but unexpected respiratory failure and there was no even criteria when i saw this patient four or five hours ago wow so there are some unusual presentations too all right if do we uh, we have one i think we are already at 430 i'll have to ask dr suresh reddy or dr sudakar do we continue at this point there is i have uh, uh, another 30 question so uh, i'll just have to ask you guys whether we end it here or shall we continue let's let's have one five more questions and uh, we will wrap up uh, i have one question to dr desai uh, is there any synergistic uh, 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 action between jitromax and uh, uh, hydroxychloroquine yeah not not synergistic that i'm aware of i mean just the just a combination of both having antiviral activity and the zithromax having some anti inflammatory activities but i don't think that they have together any kind of synergistic activity okay uh, dr jesh can you have five more questions we will wrap up yeah i have uh, i can uh, you have questions i have a lot of them uh, but well, i'm sorry i'm sure what uh, sudhakar is this you guys don't mind dr sudhakar you can, uh, you can ask can, yeah you can you. ask yeah yeah you, i have a lot of question texted here so you uh, this question about i mean robert want to answer about some igg igm is robert there doctor okay go ahead next question go ahead uh, uh there is a question for dr prasad if he is there uh high flow oxygen till what level uh, is important here in boston we are limiting to 50 liters per minute is the dr prasad still online still online yes i am uh, i think uh, that is good as long as the sats are maintained that should be good the other thing that we are doing along with that is like prone ventilation on patients who are not on ventilator even though they are on high flow oxygen because a end stage uh, i mean once they have the ards are on the ventilator we had to put uh, at least two or three patients in one day on the prone ventilation to improve their oxygenation because we are reaching the high peep and high fio2 so if it is working in those people uh, there is some data to suggest even that you know people who are on nasal cannula they should be able to benefit from that by changing the position the inflammatory fluid will move away from the posterior dependent areas to the anterior areas and that should uh, that should improve so up to 50 liters is what we are also using high flow okay and is next there, question is uh, jim tom's uh, igm igg test sorry can you answer that jim lokesh one more question for dr prasad uh, okay go ahead with Sorry. bipap with helmet mask do you have an experience we have a, i didn't know we have the helmet but we did not use the helmet mask okay all right go ahead uh, dr jim thomas the question for jim thomas i think 
Yeah, yeah. Manti Bhandi, yeah. because that's another important thing for us to go back to work. Go ahead, sir. Okay, thank you. Hear. This is Dr. Thomas again. Uh, speaking about the testing, there are, there are various types of nasal tests where they are lining up people in cars and then standing on one X, and then the same person puts a nasal swab up their nose. Um, in the pandemic of 1918, if you wanted to infect somebody, you take a mask off and then you push something up their nose. So theoretically, this method of testing, this mass testing with people who are suspected to be COVID positive could actually be inoculating people. So six weeks after this, they could come down with the COVID. It may be better rather than doing this nasal test to actually treat with the 200 milligrams of hydroxychloroquine once a week. And if they have symptoms of it, then only test the, and they have not had the hydroxychloroquine, they can start treating tests what we really need to find out is if you had the virus, and that comes from a serum test, a blood test for IgM, which is acute phase, or IgG, which is the chronic phase. That test is being developed by a company called Biomedomics, among other people, and that test is going to tell you if it's IgG positive, then you may not need the vaccine because you are already immune to it. But if you don't have the IgG after the end of this pandemic, you may need the vaccine. Thank you. Okay. I think last two questions. One, this is for Dr. Desai. Uh, no, not Dr. Desai, Dr. Sukla, Kunjan Sukla. Uh, if, if, should we do prescribing hydroxychloroquine to patient with COVID test positive as outpatient, even with mild symptoms? If we do that, do we need baseline EKG? Well, um, hydroxychloroquine uh, does have a QT prolongation action. Um, uh, the, the therapeutic dose of hydroxychloroquine is a higher dose. Um, and uh, uh, if you have a mild tenalopathy uh, genetically, uh, which is not uh, uh, very apparent on a baseline EKG, um, uh, if you give hydroxychloroquine to those patients, those patients is going to increase the QT uh, later on. So if you don't check it at all and prescribe it, prescribe it as an outpatient, there is some risk involved in a cardiac arrhythmias. Um, so, uh, you know, I think uh, what we are talking about, the prophylactic use of hydroxychloroquine would be a very, very low dose. So the risk is very low. Uh, of course, it's not gonna be zero. So the prophylactic uh, dose would be every week, one dose of hydroxychloroquine. That is probably is not going to cause a lot of cardiac arrhythmias. So if that is, uh, 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 we found out, we, if you find out that that works, then that's okay. But therapeutic dose of hydroxychloroquine should be administered in the hospital. Okay. So right now, as I understand, the prophylactic one, we are still studying it, but there's a good uh, argument that it should work, but we don't have the studies yet. But the treatment dose, if you are giving, then you will need an EKG uh, before or needs to be done in the hospital. Is that what I'm understanding? Okay. Last question. And once uh, you uh, p patient had COVID positive, and they are recovered, are they still contagious? Uh, Dr. Desai, and then we'll have, yeah. uh, after that, we'll have a, a parting comments from Dr. Sudhakar and we'll end, okay? Yeah. Uh, thank you. Go ahead. Dr. Desai, are yeah. they still contagious? Yeah, so like, we, like somebody mentioned before, viral shedding can persist even out to like, you know, um, beyond three weeks or so in some studies. So um, they could technically still be contagious, but the biggest concern is if they're symptomatic. And so if they're coughing themselves or if they're, um, you know, having uh, expectoration of the article, okay. that's what's really going to put other people at risk. But yes, at a low level, they are still contagious. Okay. There's a last comment from Dr. Raj Shah that if you have volunteers who want to do telemedicine, please contact him. He uh, will provide a free software to do telemedicine for COVID-19 patients. So you can contact him uh, later on. And Dr. Sudhakar, John Lagarda, or Dr. Reddy, if you want to give the final comments. And thank Art. you so much. I, I appreciate everybody's participation today. I think I answered majority of the questions. I could not answer, uh, take all of your questions, but we're going to have a lot of these sessions. Dr. John Lagarda.
All right. Thank you, uh, Dr. Jayesh and uh, Dr. Lokeshedra for your outstanding interaction session today. And you guys did an excellent job. Uh, Vijay, can you unmute Dr. Suresh Reddy? Seema Jay, Seema. Yeah, this is, this is, uh, okay, Seema, this is Dr. Reddy, Suresh Reddy. Go ahead, please. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. Dr. Reddy, yeah. We, yeah, we Seema, uh, you, you said, Lokesh, does Seema want to say something? Uh, Seema is there. She has a meeting uh, uh, arranging two, three days. Yes, I, uh, I right. just uh, wanted to say, uh, Suresh can go ahead and say thank you. To okay, you. yeah. F yeah. F first of all, uh, this is an amazing conference, and uh, I would like to thank, this is one of our, I think this is seventh or eighth conference, and each one has members attending more than 300 to 500 people. I'm very proud of API and all the API physicians and how all the entire team of API has come together and uh, uh, I would like to especially thank uh, the moderators for this session, Dr. Jayesh Shah, Dr. Lokesh Idara, and the speakers, Dr. Samit Desai, Dr. Gunyan Shukla, Dr. Raj Bayani, Dr. Shirish Patel, Dr. Sumul Rawal, and Dr. Himanshu Pandya. And this is amazingly organized by our own uh, president-elect, Dr. Sudhaka Jonalagadda. Um, and uh, after this, I'll give uh, thank you all. And uh, please keep uh, tuned because we'll have at least two to three meetings every week. And we have one meeting coming up by Seema, she will announce. And there is another meeting uh, will soon will be organized by Dr. Roshan Shah. Uh, that will be like a high profile. We'll have all the congressmen, uh, all the try to get the legislators, AMA, uh, American Hospital Association, and, uh, and also interestingly, the Pakistani Association and the Bangladeshi uh, Medical Association, they want to join us uh, because this is uh, uh, at the end of the day, we are all cousins, and uh, and uh, this is a South Asian and also a global problem. And uh, so the next meeting, I think uh, it will be next Saturday, I think. Wednesday will be organized by Dr. Seema Arora from Boston. And after that, uh, will be organized by Dr. Roshan Shah. That will be a very high-profile legislator. Uh, the main issues that will be discussed next Saturday will be how to get uh, the international medical graduates who haven't got into residencies, try to get them into the workforce so that they'll be on a FEMA, FEMA like a federal emergency medic, uh, uh, emergency kind of thing, but it'll be on the medical side. And also how to get the fourth year students to get a limited licenses to work. Uh, and also the physicians working in rural areas on J1 and H1 waiver research, how they can work and uh, try to get their goals achieved. So multiple issues coming, multiple uh, solutions, and uh, uh, I am so proud of API. This is everybody coming together, and uh, thank you so much. And uh, uh, I'll uh, give back the mic to Dr. Jayesh and uh, Lokesh Idara. Thank you, and Sudha Lagata. Thank you. Uh, I, uh, thank you again, um, the panel and uh, um, our uh, uh, moderators, Dr. Shah and Dr. Lokesh Idara, and. Uh, uh, Please stay tuned for more and more uh, interactive sections uh, in future. You are to fight against this virus. And um, again, you know, thank National API and uh, thank you all for joining today. Thank you. I think Seema, right. Seema wants to say something. Or? Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, just stay tuned. Uh, for on Wednesday, we'll have some more questions answered. Those who could not uh, uh, get their questions answered, we will continue with the uh, sessions from. Uh, um, uh, specialists from Boston and, you know, well-known specialists and some other specialists uh, and uh, we'll cover some more of this and uh, also what's happening in the world um, um, with um, Echo Project and Emergent Medicine and stuff like that. Um, so please stay tuned. Please come back uh, on Wednesday and uh, for our other sessions, coming sessions. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys. Dr. Shah, you will be closing. No, I think uh, I really want to appreciate everyone uh, for joining today. I think sharing the information, this is the time of pandemics. We need to hold each other's hand by, you know, keep the social distancing, but to hold hands uh, on electronically and help everyone uh, mm -hmm. because this is the time to really uh, help our patients. This is the time to step up and show that we are, uh, you know, the one who can help uh, in this crisis. So I really am proud of API and proud of all the physicians who are in the front.
Thank you so much. Great. Please wear mask when you go out, and please wear mask. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, guys. Thank you. Thank you.